Right. Good morning, everybody. So let me start with the next lecture of our course. And uh, again, we have uh, quite um, steep change of topic. It's still about quantum transport, but today we will concentrate on small quantum corrections, sir. We will consider conductance in uh, many channel situations. Uh, where, as we study, uh, electron transport seemingly is almost classical. Manifestations of its quantum uh, nature are small. And uh, that's precisely what we will concentrate. Well, historically, it was important. Uh, historically, there was large activity on studying these corrections uh, to reveal quantum features in what people uh, didn't think they are. Uh, also, today, nowadays, if you just uh, address experimentally any structure, uh, you will be able, any metallic structure, you will be able to see um, the manifestations of uh, quantum corrections. Um, mostly, these manifestations is about uh, dependence of conductance on magnetic field. This is an experimental way to sort out um, classical and quantum uh, quantum uh, contribution. We kind of already roughly understand why it is so. Uh, the um, manifestation of quantum effects here is uh, an interference. And interference can be changed, can be tuned by magnetic field. It's a sort of Aronoff bomb effect is going on. So at some places of this lecture, I will be back to the lecture about interference. Uh, right, what's important um, to kind of take back home, well, I will also summarize it in the first transparency, uh, the corrections to large conductors, many channels, Conductance is much bigger than conductance quantum. The corrections are always of the road of conductance quantum, like only one channel of money uh, exhibits quantum phenomena. And there are two sorts of these corrections. Weak localization, which is about um, corrections in um, uh, large samples where it is averaged, and uh, conductance fluctuations, which are called universal for some reason. Uh, magnetic field dependence, I have already mentioned. We will look at some experiments, and we will consider some uh, interesting fancy things um, uh, related to more elaborated Theory of this kind of uh, corrections. Anti localization based on spin, uh, spin scattering, interesting topic. We will understand how to express these corrections in terms of return probability. Uh, then there will be something which will um, also could be useful in um, uh, other areas of physics, that is a uh, uh, mighty tool set, which is called random matrix theory, random matrix approach to disordered systems, and we will uh, touch this, I will outline it during the lecture. Um, time allows, I will tell you a little bit about uh, strong localization. In contrast to weak localization, we will consider right away. 
Um, good. Let me go on. All right, so we look uh, at the corrections. So we'll concentrate on a coherent uh, classical conductor. Classical uh, in the sense that it can be described by Ohm's law, uh, by local conductivity in each point. Uh, you remember these um, uh, equations which relate um, current and uh, electric field uh, locally and uh, that will allow us to find uh, the distribution of potential in a complex structure. Uh, good. This means that it has many channels, so its conductance is much bigger than GQ, than this um, uh, value which appears in every lecture of every course. Uh, in different aspects, it characterizes scattering, it characterizes complicate. Uh, right, and uh, this small interference contribution appears to be, and we will understand why it's it so in some ways, but the message to take home is that interference contribution is of the order of contribution of one channel. Right, uh, this contribution, although small, can be distinguished from this classical contribution and uh, as I have already uh, told, um, the uh, most common way to uh, assess this experimentally is to apply magnetic field and look at fine features in magnetic conductance. So there is a change of conductance upon magnetic field and uh, this, uh, this observation is interpreted in terms of uh, quantum corrections. Uh, right, uh, what I want to explain that uh, frequently um, the measurements, the revealing of quantum uh, corrections happen in sufficiently large samples when uh, the conductor becomes incoherent. It means that um, uh, electrons are not, uh, do not, do not keep quantum coherence, uh, do not stay uh, waves throughout the uh, transport through conductors. They will lose energy, they will lose their phase, in the last lecture, we will look at concrete mechanisms of this. Let me just uh, tell at the moment that this will happen at certain land scale, which depends on temperature, impurities, uh, different parameters. Um, what will happen if uh, I take a conductor which is larger than the scale? Well, uh, that can be seen as a collection of smaller coherent conductors. Uh, right, and um, each conductor will give you a correction of the order of conductance correction, correction to conductance. We will see how does it uh, end into in uh, the resistance uh, and all these quantities. So this particular message is that one can see quantum corrections in very large samples where propagation of electrons is not entirely coherent from one lead to another lead. Uh, right, as I mentioned, uh, um, that was um, 
large discover large series of discoveries in quantum transport which uh, concern these corrections and uh, here if you hear the words which are not very popular nowadays like uh, mesoscopics that's mostly about this um most common conductor uh, which uh, people doubt is in this uh, chart is uh, extended diffusive conductor what does it mean diffusive uh, just a piece of metal whatever metal wire with impurities around there they're automatically you don't have to put it there um, each uh, metal is impure that determines its resistance uh, right and uh, you just take it in a scale which is bigger than mean three pass so electron motion is uh, diffusive throughout the sample uh, good this is about corrections any questions about this topic about uh, this transparency I don't see any. Anyway, I've been repeating that many times. It would be um, good to me to feel your feedback, just to feel your presence, or uh, the more questions you would put to the chart, the more active I will be. And uh, right, that will uh, reduce the chance that I get asleep in the middle of the lecture. Fine. Good. Um, let me go on. Let me talk about two main sorts of these corrections. Let me talk about weak localization. Uh, it's a fancy term. Uh, perhaps uh, one can spend several phrases to explain why it is this. Um, interference uh, actually is related to um, localization of the waves. Perhaps it's not evident uh, from the uh, very beginning. Uh, let me um, recall uh, a, a system which is similar to the system which we can consider double barrier junction. Let me talk about Fabry Perot uh, interference. So there are two mirrors, and there is a wave. which would go through these two mirrors. Um, if there is partial reflection on this wave, it will go back and forth between the mirrors. And if um, uh, transmission coefficients are small, it can be completely localized between them, right? So you would have uh, like um, um, localized uh, state of the wave. It might um, be said to result from interference. The degree of localization can be weak or strong. Um, yeah, if transparency of the barriers uh, is large enough, um, the localization is obviously weak. If uh, um, barriers are, for instance, many, one can th think of uh, waves which are completely localized between the barriers, and uh, yeah, this is strong localization. Weak localization. But uh, the definition uh, does have, have, has nothing to do with localizing uh, wave functions. It's just correction to conductance, which is averaged, which is averaged over formally 
identical nanostructures. That kind of uh, suggests um, uh, the following um, uh, procedure, um, which is of course not very practical, but in principle can be done. You just uh, fabricate uh, um, conductors of the same shape, same uh, nominal conductance, and uh, you measure them, you see some deviations, and uh, you average it over a big uh, number of samples, and you obtain this um, weak localization correction. Uh, who can tell me why it is um, not practical? Um, once again, what I want to do, I, I want to make uh, uh, samples of the same conductance, but yeah, from sample to sample, I would have uh, different impurity configurations, different interference patterns. So I will have uh, uh, fluctuations from sample to sample, and I want to average these fluctuations. Uh, I want to find the uh, quantum part. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, indeed, it's uh, what uh, I um, uh, read now in the chart. Maybe it's very hard to make samples of the same conductors. Indeed, it uh, looks uh, rather um, straightforward task. Just, you know, make everything better, wash your hands, um, and uh, you get more and more accurate fabrication technology, and uh, you would be able to produce that. Uh, however, in practice, um, it does not work. Um, this uh, pertains to small systems, which are cut edge of uh, physics. You can uh, never make two identical ones. Um, that also pertains to large conductances. There is an um, uh, interesting uh, story, which I, I just wonder if I have enough time, but this uh, years I still, um, I still I have time, so I can uh, tell you an interesting story about attempts to make the um, um, same uh, uh, conductors and um, uh, unusual political consequences of this. Right, that was a story about Cold War. So that was United States against Soviet Union. And uh, there was a competition in uh, whatever um, in uh, military aspects like in producing missiles. What do we need uh, from a missile? But but uh, by technology of that time, you would need uh, to have some sophisticated, uh, perhaps not a computer, but very sophisticated electron scheme from uh, say a million of similar elements which would uh, provide guidance to your missile. Right. And uh, if you have a kind of a sufficiently developed technology based on market economy, uh, you are able to produce this elements with decent accuracy small dispersion let me talk about resistance 
Um, and uh, that would um, allow you to make a working a scheme from several thousand elements. Very good. That was uh, American situation. They um, produce medical equipment. It was expensive. It was, you know, waste of money. But well, somehow they managed to uh, do this. How about Soviet Union? I have to mark it red. Uh, technology was uh, several um, steps before. Sir, eventual distribution of uh, elements was, uh, say, three times larger. They did the same microelectronic elements, but the, the discussion was too big. Sir, if you uh, now um, uh, make a circuit out of that, most likely it would not work. So, who can suggest how do they manage? They produced uh, approximately the same number of missiles, uh, all this uh, military technology as uh, United States. Any suggestions? So if you use these elements, you want to make a circuit that doesn't work. What to do? Yes, you're not interested in an example. Uh, make another one. It doesn't work. Make another one. And another one. Then statistically, you would get a part of this distribution when all elements uh, do not differ much from each other and uh, the, the scheme works. So for one circuit, it be, has been produced in the um, United States. Soviets, in some critical cases, have to make hundred. Like, and uh, let's take a uh, um, cost of this um, circuit, like uh, ten thousand dollar. Estimate the expenses they have to make. Sir, so in um, some time their economy just crashed because of this. They want to keep up the competition and uh, they basically wasted very much material, very much uh, money and the economy could not work anymore. Good, that was about importance of distribution, importance of technology. <coughs> Good. So, uh, let us get to more practical ways of uh, averaging. Uh, uh, as I, can, I have already told, we could just take sufficiently big sample, which won't be coherent, but, well, we can uh, define a coherent uh, lens. We know how much it is. And we can separate the sample onto many um, smaller samples which are still coherent. Let me uh, figure out what would be um, uh, observed change of uh, conductance in this case. Uh, right, so each uh, conductor we will have this correction. So the total change of uh, conductance will be eventually inversely proportional to number of elements. 
Okay, but the conductance uh, can be measured with a high precision. So even if it's uh, 10,000 elements, um, you can still measure something. Right, so we will look some experimental results which have made uh, in samples of the order of centimeters, and one can still see the signatures of interference. Very good. As that was about weak localization, which is average correction. There are also fluctuations um, uh, as it is, and those are defined F situation of conductance of formally identical uh, nanostructures, which again suggests the same, not very practical way to measure it. You just make usual, um, you, you just make many identical conductors and look now at fluctuation at the spread of conductances. Um, good, so I can write it like this. Uh, conductance uh, is uh, classical value plus uh, weak localization correction plus some fluctuation. And again, it turns out that this fluctuation is of the order of conductance control. Um, well, one can um, also, these fluctuations in the big and coherent samples to circumvent this unrealistic procedure of making many identical things. Um, so, by big and coherent sample, uh, one can um, uh, compute basically this fluctuation. Uh, fluctuation of each. Uh, so let me let me give more details. First of all, it is um, sure that the full resistance of the sample is the sum is the sum of individual resistances of coherent conductors. Uh, each. Um, Fluctuation, fluctuations are independent uh, in the terms of this sum. Uh, so it means that the square root of fluctuations is proportional to n, the number of fluctuators. Uh, right, that expresses the um, um, variance of. Uh, overall conductance in terms of variances of elements. Um, as to variance of elements, yeah, it is um, variation of uh, resistance in terms of variation of conductance. This is resistance per element. Um, all right, so after all, you see what would be fluctuation of conductance of large incoherent sample? Well, it would be inversely proportional to um, a big number, number of incoherent conductors. But still, since resistance can be measured to its high accuracy, it is still plausible to, to measure this. Uh, fine. So, now we identified two aspects of quantum corrections, weak localization and universal conductance fluctuations. We understand that one can uh, measure it uh, even uh, if, uh, if uh, the samples are not totally coherent. Um, Let me recall what we have already started in the second lecture. Let me recall um, a picture of interference, um, how it is um, affected by magnetic field. Uh, right. 
if you remember, we consider a simple system which consisted of two beam splitters and electrons can traverse this um, system in a variety of ways. Each way, each trajectory provides a contribution to transmission amplitude. We are interested in probabilities. We have to square this amplitude. So we need to uh, square uh, a sum of these individual contributions of the trajectories. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about probabilities, if we talk about conductance, then the contribution comes from pairs of such trajectories. Is this point clear? Interference, it's like a double slit or many slit exper experiment. And each trajectory, it works like a individual slit. So interference contribution to the probability, to the conductance, to the transmission coefficient, comes about two trajectories. Let us see, I, I see and something in the chat. Uh, yes, 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 it's very positive, yes. Um, good, so uh, that's why in order to um, uh, illustrate uh, how a particular interference contribution comes about, I have to sketch a pair of trajectories. Um, what about um, uh, conductance fluctuation, universal conductance fluctuations? Right, that's simple. That comes uh, of, from interference of uh, two trajectories which take uh, different passes. Um, and um, the change of the phase along these trajectories uh, will contain the flux magnetic field, which is within the loop, will be affected by this magnetic field. But it also picks up a dynamical phase, um, uh, which is accumulated when electron moves uh, through the sample. Right, so there is a difference of dynamical phases for these trajectories. And if one averages over all dynamical phases, one gets zero. That's why this contribution is uh, fluctuating, is of fluctuative uh, nature. Uh, but we also have figured out that there are contributions a little bit more involved which uh, do not depend on magnetic uh, on, on dynamical phase, right? Here's the example. So let me uh, repeat again that those are trajectories, one and another one, which differ by um, let me raise as well, so I don't see. They differ by a way uh, an electron makes a loop between the band, the beam splitters. It's either clockwise or counterclockwise, right? And that means that these trajectories have the same dynamical phases. Dynamical phase doesn't depend in which direction you um, transfer a piece of, um, uh, like a piece of uh, quantum channel over here. Uh, so dynamical phase cancels from interference of these trajectories, and it only depends on magnetic field. Uh, right, so we associate weak localization with this type of interference, where dynamical phase is canceled, and uh, 
fluctuations, uh, universal conductance fluctuations, just account for any other interference. Um, fine. Um, let us try a very um, qualitative uh, level understand the magnetic field dependence in the case of irregular trajectories. With these two beam splitters, we knew precisely how electrons uh, go. There are only a few uh, possibilities. Uh, for electrons in diffusive samples, trajectories, I wonder if you see this. Trajectories can be, I just write this part of the picture. Uh, trajectories can be, well, very complex. Uh, it's a diffusive trajectory, one trajectory, another trajectory, and there is interference between them. Uh, right, let me identify trajectory which might exhibit, for instance, weak localization. In this case, uh, we would consider pairs uh, given by orange and green of um, uh, very similar trajectories, very close to each other. The difference between them is um, they go through a loop in two different directions. Right? So one goes clockwise, another goes counterclockwise. One would uh, say that perhaps these trajectories are highly improbable, but in fact, in uh, uh, half an hour, we figure out precisely how many these trajectories are available. Um, good. Interference of these trajectories will give us. Um, um, Uh, weak localization. And uh, let me just note at the moment that they, this uh, pairs, they have very different size of the loops. Uh, right? And um, um, depending on the size of the loop, magnetic field either gives very little effect on this phase or it gives a uh, very large phase uh, change which uh, loops are relevant with which uh, lens um, is uh, when the area which is uh, of the loop uh, times magnetic field would match conductance quantum. That suggests there is a certain um, uh, space scale, which depends on magnetic field, at which uh, interference is affected. You change magnetic field, you change the scale, which means that you kind of uh, may scan interference uh, contribution of uh, different trajectories with different uh, loop size. Good, this is um, diffusive trajectory. This is its typical distance. And uh, let us recall how, uh, let us recall diffusion uh, law, how time and lens of diffusive trajectory are uh, related. Uh, uh, how time and spread of diffusive trajectory uh, are related. So eventually um, in diffusion um, um, squared, the spread is directly proportional to time. Um, so from, um, uh, from uh, the land scale, which is determined by conductance quantum, one can also 
um, uh, also get the estimation for um, time scale. The question is, uh, let's see, what is the variable d? d, uh, it also appeared a little bit earlier, e is diffusion coefficient. d stays for diffusion. Uh, the motion of an electron in a diffusion sample is characterized by diffusion coefficient, and uh, that's uh, that's what we have here. All right. Um, let us see. Let's go on. Let me. Again, it's a uh, first experiment is a recollection. Uh, first experiment I have already shown. This is uh, experiment of Sharvin and Sharvin, father and son collaboration. And they look at conductance of uh, metallic cylinders versus magnetic field. Um, so if one, um, I don't remember whether it's seen in the picture. So eventual change of uh, conductance was uh, uh, small, like a fraction of ohm per uh, uh, full resistance of a structure, which was like a hundred uh, uh, ohms, if I recall correctly. So it was about small contribution. Since uh, it was a cylinder of rather definite cross-section, a cylinder like this, this was cross-section, uh, right? The oscillations were rather uh, periodic in magnetic field. Okay, that's interference. Uh, again, this sample was uh, long, so it consisted of uh, many incoherent samples like this. Anyway, uh, the um, uh, interference signal is uh, smaller. It is its case like uh, one over a number of these uh, scales. Nevertheless, uh, it was sufficiently big to measure. Um, now I give more, I gave more typical experiment. Right in this case, as a structure has no cylinder nor um, size which could measure magnetic field. It was in fact um, just uh, uh, it, it was two-dimensional structure uh, to the electron gas, kind of a sheet of electron gas, and uh, that um, can be affected by again voltage, and uh, they measure magnetic field dependence. Let's just look at it uh, as observation without trying to understand um, at the moment what is the origin of this X. Uh, or oh, features, yeah. Um, we are going at very small magnetic fields, so the rod of my um, uh, milli Tesla, and we see something instead of uh, plane dependence, uh, we see something like a peak, very narrow peak of certain lens with small. Uh, magnitude, then something strange has happened um, with this uh, peak. Um, there are like veins, uh, and uh, eventually uh, one gets the idea that one can see this contribution as a superposition of a long deep. And wide, deep, sorry, and uh, more narrow peak. All right. And uh, you see they change um, gate voltage affecting uh, affecting uh, density of electrons. 
in the structure, they can see uh, a change of relative contribution of a P and a T. Fine, interesting uh, observation related to recapitalization revealed by So it's a typical um, uh, experiment uh, which uh, where liquidization uh, is manifested. If you have any loops in the structure, anything which you can um, relate with a certain flux, then you can uh, see interference. Uh, you, you can see periodic patterns usually they don't have it, uh, then you would see uh, here, let me just uh, put it empirically, a collections of uh, peaks and dips in uh, conductance of uh, different small bits in magnetic field. Right, uh, let us um, understand it later. Let me talk about uh, universal conductance fluctuations. Uh, I have already shown this experiment. It's a typical, uh, the pioneer in um, UCF um, experiment. Uh, but one can um, see such effects in uh, many structures. Um, good, so um, to recall, uh, there was a um, structure of a thin metallic feel, uh, film with a ring inside, and uh, they wanted to see a run of um, bomb effect. Okay, basically, I guess they would uh, hope to see something like Sharvin and so would, uh, uh, would observe. They have seen a more complex picture, uh, what they called uh, grass, which uh, can be seen uh, as um, uh, as um, random signal, like you have uh, random uh, uh, waves in magnetic field with different periods. So they look at the spectrum of the signal, they reveal uh, peaks corresponding to a run of bomb effect to the trajectories which makes different number of uh, circles around this loop. Uh, but randomness uh, was uh, persisting even in this uh, spectrum. So this is manifestation of uh, universal conductance fluctuations. Uh, it is random. Uh, again, one sees that this is um, this happens at very small scale. If one converts the scale to conductance, uh, those are oscillations of the order of uh, conductance quantum. If the structure were ideally ideally uh, um, censored to say, um, the uh, spectrum would be kind of more concentrated. But there is also some area of the arms where electrons uh, can also pick up flux. So that this distribution of uh, fluxes per trajectories, which makes 
this peaks uh, wide, Jeff. Uh, right. Uh, if there is no flux, sorry, if there is no loop at all, what would we see? Well, we would see in a spectrum something like this. Still, it would be a random curve, grassy curve. I um, would not dare uh, to draw it now. Um, with no obvious peri uh, periods, with no obvious scale like this. So, let us say this is uh, a manifestation of this peak separation. This is manifestation of the corona point effect. Uh, and uh, for without this uh, loop, one would see some uniform signal like this magnetic field dependence. All right, that's how uh, universal conductance fluctuations are manifested in uh, the experiment. Good, so quite measurable, measurable quantity. Right, let me tell you about some uh, strange, uh, say purely quantum and um, uh, funny phenomenon. We talk about uh, context, we are in the context of weak localization. Let me consider propagation between two points, whichever um, one and two. And there are two trajectories um, which are close to each other, so they, they cancel their dynamical phases, they differ only by uh, by motion uh, around the, the loop. Um, uh, let me consider the effect of these trajectories. If I don't take into account uh, spin in uh, electron propagation, the um, um, contribution of these trajectories to conductance will be negative and it will result in smaller conductance, which is uh, localization. Um, it is uh, interesting uh, mathematical trick. If, if spin is taken into account, it's this contribution can change sign and eventually lead to high conductance. Um, what does it depend on? This depends on uh, how much uh, speed to change the moving along the trajectory. Ideally, if there's only potential scattering, the motion is not, uh, orbital motion is not affected by spin. And uh, this is uh, negligible, so one could just forget about the presence of spin. If spin changes, one can characterize these amplitudes uh, by matrices, matrices in spin space. Uh, right, these matrices have a part which doesn't change spin and which has. So there's A0 and vector A. Right, and if we take two trajectories like this, and if we uh, um, uh, look at the contribution 
to the interference, the spin part will come with opposite sign, which will be uh, anti-localization. All right, in order to see that, this spin part should be rather big. Uh, it means that the um, uh, orbital motion and in particular scattering at the impurities changes spin. So there was a strong spin orbit scattering. Good, so the, uh, this simple example uh, shows that perhaps um, a strong spin of its scattering can affect if localization can even change its sign. Right, let me get to some formulas. Uh, let me outline an uh, interesting thing which I would argue at rather qualitative um, um, level. Let me explain the relation between weak localization and return probability. Um, let us see. Let me try to find the ratio of uh, interference affected conductance to the total conductance, which is mostly classical conductance. Uh, in order to do so, I um, need to look at all trajectories and I will have to find the ratio of numbers of trajectories which have the loops like this and which do not have the loops. If you're kind of geometrically inclined, you would certainly say, oh, this is zero. Indeed, um, it uh, requires fine tuning of two trajectories to get it intersect. Trajectories without intersection are much more probable. Never mind. Um, a trajectory is um, uh, approximation, uh, semi classic semi-classical approximation. In fact, instead of uh, a line, a curve picture of this trajectory, one has to take into account a spread of trajectory in this direction, which has the size of electron wavelengths. All right, in this case, if there are not trajectories, if there are other tubes with the width of the order of um, uh, wavelengths, they can intersect. There is finite uh, number. Uh, and uh, what this picture makes evident that this weak localization correction is now related to return probability. Right? Uh, how can I see it? I just start in this particular point into point of interception, so there is a diffusive trajectory, it goes that, 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 that. I would like to figure out um, uh, the probability to return uh, after a certain time, after a certain diffusion time. Right. This coefficient related to the uh, the gold wavelengths 
is eventually converted to this one. It can be related to density of uh, states in the metal. And, uh, well, I have, uh, I have uh, also return probability. Well, I can, uh, we can easily estimate return probability. How? It's a completely uh, classical picture of diffusion. We have uh, a particle which uh, is at initial moment of time is localized at the point uh, R prime. After diffusion, this particle spreads. And this is described by diffusion equation. So, um, uh, particle density after some time would obtain this equation with a source. It just says, well, I created a particle uh, at, at uh, t equals zero at this position. Uh, right, so to find this probability, one needs to solve diffusion equation. Um, here, in addition to probability, we have a collection of uh, different factors. First factor is dephasing. In this case, uh, interference, quantum mechanical coherence is just uh, crashed by some, um, uh, is destroyed by some um, mechanism related to uh, dissipation, uh, related to energy exchange between electrons. That happens at some time. So if uh, time is not enough, the trajectory continues to interference. If this time is uh, too short, it does not. So this is described by this exponential factor. Magnetic field. It also um, suppresses uh, interference at the scales bigger than some typical uh, time of motion, which depends on the magnetic field, when uh, the electron covers the area of the rotor of flux that we have discussed in the beginning of this lecture. So I have a similar contribution due to uh, magnetic field. These uh, weak localization. It is a little bit more complicated, but in fact, uh, uh, rather simple. In this case, there are two contributions of opposite sign. And one contribution is suppressed by spin orbit scattering. And that comes with three. And that is related to the fact that it's three Pauli matrices. And uh, one is not suppressed. It is related to the fact that there is a, only a single matrix to by two which uh, does not depend on spin, just unitary matrix. So uh, there are four possible uh, two by two matrices. There are three Pauli matrices related to spin. And there is one which does not depend on spin. Uh, good, with this we can actually predict um, the, um, actually if I have no time for this, uh, the amplitude of uh, this um, uh, big localization correction and eventually uh, recover its dependence on magnetic field and uh, on um, 
defacing and also on on um, spin orbit time but first let me um, start with a, a simple estimation because I want to check consistency I want to show that this uh, um, estimation in terms of return probability uh, is equivalent to the statement which is made as a statement that um, the change of uh, conductance uh, due to equalization is of the order of conductance quantum. Uh, let me make it quickly. So um, let me consider something uh, simple. Let me consider structure which just uh, has a certain uh, volume and otherwise it is open to the uh, lead. So what I can say about this uh, uh, probability to uh, return. If time is smaller than escape time to the leads, this probability is just one over volume. Why is it so? So particles initially hear them, it quickly spreads over this volume and escapes to, escapes to the leads later. Uh, right. So now we estimate uh, the ratio of two conductances. And uh, what we have here, we have here volume, we have here escape time, which is uh, uh, expressed as inverse of escape rate. And uh, with density of states, this will give us level spacing delta s in this um, in this uh, in this structure good but we can relate the uh, escape and uh, escape rate and um, uh, number of levels i believe we did this uh, calculation this is just the ratio of uh, conductance and conductance quantum. The more conductance, the bigger escape uh, uh, rate is. Uh, right, so that's how we can reproduce uh, um, the fact that uh, quantum corrections are of the order of conductance quantum. I don't want to describe, uh, uh, to write formulas for um, results of uh, 2D. Um, don't want to write uh, um, this. Um, let me just uh, get back to the experiment and let me qualitat uh, qualitatively explain what's going on uh, without without uh, uh, formulas. Uh, as we see, there is a sequence of magnetic resistance curves which depend on the gate voltage applied and it appears to be that this voltage tuned the strands of spin orbit interaction in this material. Right. And um, if uh, spin orbit interaction is small, 
and uh, if uh, spin orbit uh, char uh, spin orbit rate uh, 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 is uh, smaller than the diffusion rate then we basically see a dip Right, so it was localized to zero magnetic field and magnetic field kills interference, uh, resistance goes up. For spin, so sufficiently big spin orbit interaction, we see, as I said, anti-localization, we see a peak, which is of uh, opposite sign. Uh, it's uh, rather sharp. So the difference uh, of the lists between the tips is because uh, one peak is um, determined by um, the list of, of the peak is uh, determined by the following. We have time related to uh, say magnetic field and the phase in time or you can compare the uh, magnetic time and spin orbit time right since this 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 um, depends on the magnetic field it gives you a scale in magnetic field so from this one can actually measure both times, the phase and time, and uh, the time of uh, spin orbit interaction. Good. So with a simple approach, one can uh, understand uh, the features of experiment. Uh, the feeds uh, are done with a simple formulas, which I don't want to write them down explicitly. Uh, good, so that was about weak localization. Uh, let me now change the topic again. And uh, let me consider, it's not like different um, mathematical method, although it's based on uh, mathematics, it's a different way of um, thinking. It is random matrix theory. In fact, it's a branch of uh, mass, but a rather simple mass, uh, linear algebra, which you studied uh, in your bachelor program problem, uh, you know that many physical quantities um, can be um, involve matrices, linear equations, uh, Hamiltonian is a matrix, uh, um, so scattering, which we uh, have studied, it's also characterized by scattering matri uh, um, matrix. Um, uh, we will uh, talk also another time actually next lecture about um, random matrix theory for Hamiltonians. Uh, for us it is now random matrix theory of scattering matrix. But let me tell you something uh, about um, about uh, eigenvalues of Hamiltonian matrix, um, uh, which, for instance, describes levels in quantum dots. Right, so I have uh, levels, eigenvalues, of uh, big random matrix. I can place it on a energy axis like this. And uh, I wonder 
what would be the distribution of these levels. So I have probability which depends on all level positions. And there is an answer for this, which is called Wigner Dyson distribution. Um, what is the message of this distribution? Levels repel each other. There's absolutely no probability for these two levels to come to the same point. Probability goes to zero at this point. The levels behave, and that's why I wanted to show you this picture, as charges Uh, which are placed on this one-dimensional line. They try to avoid each other. Well, if I put uh, physically many charges like this, they would uh, go to infinity. Uh, they would run away from the middle of the wire. I have to confine that somehow. Uh, and uh, this is what is called confining potential in Wigner Dyson distribution. It uh, is related to the fluctuation of matrix elements. And well, perhaps I can sketch it in the form of potential for these charges. This is a, a kind of parabolic potential. Uh, the interaction between charges is eventually uh, logarithmic. Uh, look, if I associate this, um, uh, with a thermal distribution, I need some energy which will depend on the uh, position of the charges. So it's going to be logarithmic. Logarithmic repulsion. It's not like a repulsion from um, point like charges, which is one over R. Uh, rather, it is a repulsion from uh, lone charge wires. So if one would like to extend a static uh, analogy, one has to imagine a wire which is perpendicular to the screen, and each wire will present an eigenvalue. Logarithmic repulsion, which is, which uh, results in power law, and this very funny feature here: the power, power beta. From this formula, we understand that it's like um, beta, which is uh, inverse of temperature in statistical mechanics. This, uh, if you change it really as a parameter, it would be a, a temperature for this system of charges. Uh, for random matrices, funny enough, this temperature, inverse temperature, can take only four values. And uh, this depends on the type of the matrix in use. On matrix ensemble, as we call it. For instance, I can just consider general Hermitian matrices, all that, that will uh, be called unitary ensemble. I could consider symmetric matrices. 
And symmetric matrices I have if I want to describe the systems without, um, uh, sorry, the systems with time reversibility, time reversal system. Uh, Hamiltonian in this case it can be made symmetric. And this is situation with the absence of magnetic field in physical terms. So it's orthogonal uh, ensemble. In addition to that, one can talk about symplectic ensemble. Don't want to give mathematical uh, details, but this corresponds to the case of strong spin orbit interaction, like we will see in an anti-localization um, domain. Uh, let me just uh, show you this picture. And uh, that will say us something important about fluctuations uh, of the levels, um, about intensity of repulsion in the, uh, of the levels. This is just for uh, random. So I did not uh, take any metrics. I just put uh, uh, this le uh, levels at random. Okay, one can see this randomness. One can see very big spacings and very short spacings between the levels. If you um, go to ensembles, uh, it's uh, uh, worth noting that the spectral rigidity in this case. So the variation of number of levels in a big strip like this becomes just of the order of one, but it's also it also depends on this uh, index characterizing that sample on this inverse temperature. So if you go uh, through ensembles, it looks you change the temperature. Your temperature kind of infinite. Uh, orthogonal, you see more order. Unitary, you see much more order. And symplectic looks already very similar to just equidistant levels, which I put as a reference. Good. So, in uh, eigenvalues, of random matrices, we see ordering, we see spectral rigidity, small variation of number of levels in the certain um, energy strip. And uh, this is uh, most important message which comes from the theory of random matrices. All right, so I'm doing with respect to time. Um, yeah, I guess I will be able to uh, say everything which I wanted. Good, let us um, apply this general uh, knowledge of random matrices to um, our system, system of uh, uh, transport. So, as we know, the quantum transport is completely determined by transmission eigenvalues, eigenvalues of transmission matrix squared. Uh, this is a bit different from traditional uh, uh, Wigner-Dyson distribution. 
because eigenvalues uh, are kind of transmission coefficients, they are restricted to intro for, from zero to one. Uh, but um, um, uh, qualitative features, level repulsion, ordering of eigenvalues, all this remains the same, can be can be decided from um, from Wigner um, uh, Dyson distribution. The concrete density of eigenvalues, as we know, it depends on nanostructure type. And let me uh, just give you a result which can be um, derived and which uh, has a simple formula for a uh, transmission distribution of uh, periodic cavity. So we have two uh, quantum point contacts in series. The number of modes in this um, quantum point contact is eventually ML and RR. So what do we get? We have level repulsion. It's the same term as in Dyson distribution. And we have also confinement, which makes sure that uh, repelling levels don't go anywhere, that they still confined to the interval from zero to one in this case. Uh, right, so it uh, means that uh, the general reasoning about uh, random matrices can be applied to this case as well. So let us look, for instance, at conductance fluctuations. What we have to know um, from this, how we can recall, uh, how we can um, estimate it from this um, uh, terms. Well, uh, conductance is just the sum of all transmission uh, coefficients. If you compute the variance of the conductance, which we need for fluctuations, uh, well, it would be just a correlation between different transmission uh, eigenvalues. Correlation depends on directions. That's why it is uh, sensitive to to um, to uh, level repulsion. Let's have uh, it uh, simple. Uh, let us estimate the conductance as the number of uh, eigenvalues in a strip of the rotor of one. Right, so we know that uh, conductance is determined by uh, transmission coefficients of the rotor of one that makes a choice of the strip. So variance in this case would be given by a random matrix formula. Variance will be constant, not depending on number of the levels in the strip. This is given by, uh, by average conductance. If you would just consider random transmission, uh, random numbers, random transmission coefficients, rather than eigenvalues of your matrix, the variance would be proportional to the number of the levels. The variance would be proportional to the conductance, but it's not the case. I've crossed this. Uh, and this is spectral rigidity of random matrices, which leads to estimation. I have started my lecture with estimations that quantum correction is of the order of contribution of a single uh, channel. The same can be done for um, uh, weak localization. I don't want to intrude you with too much details. 
So again, for this um, simple model of uh, chaotic uh, uh, cavity, um, one can get explicit formulas for weak localization for uh, uh, universal conductance fluctuations. They will depend on the terms uh, like uh, the ratio of uh, conductances of this uh, of these two um, contacts but the uh, the size is um, uh, typical sizes of the rotor of GQ uh, let us see let me look at this time realistically I wonder if I can say about the um, uh, weak localization and lecture time. It turns out that not. Let me make um, uh, the following arrangements. I will uh, stop lecture here. You may go. And uh, in uh, five minutes, I will uh, say more about weak and strong localization, about localization in um, uh, one dimensions in some more detail. I guess it will take another five, uh, 15 minutes. And uh, naturally enough, I um, would uh, record this. I will start in a minute um, just to figure out how to close all these windows. This is Zoom. Here am I again. And I will um, share the screen again. And we will talk about the relation between weak and strong localization and its dependence on geometry, on effective uh, uh, effective uh, dimensionality of a sample. All right, let me get some simple facts. Let me try to put it in the wrong. If we consider pure metal uh, without impurities, then the wave functions in this metal are just plain waves. They are absolutely delocalized. Electrons got through the metal and the probability to find the uh, an electron uh, is the same in all um, in all points of the spectrum. Right. Then, if we look at a more common metal, usual metal, uh, in the situation where Ohm's law is uh, is um, uh, Ohm's law holds, uh, wave functions are scattered. Right, wave functions become very complicated, scattered waves. Each impurity would contribute to a, a, a pattern, a, to interference pattern of these uh, functions, but still they will be localized. And so they still will be delocalized. Uh, let me uh, consider another situation situation of quantum dots when we just uh, like Coulomb Island when we really localize electrons in a piece of uh, metal right and we make a contact of this quantum dot to uh, say bigger metallic electrons 
we will try to figure out where uh, the localization would still hold. So. This won't uh, go well if uh, conductance of the contact is too large. In fact, it has to be smaller than conductance quantum. Right, and also Ohm's law is uh, uh, violated for the situation when conductance is of the order of conductance quantum by the sir. It's just uh, because um, Ohm's law is valid for a big number of channels, right? And it's not supposed to hold for a few channels. Right, it's there are four facts and they don't seem to be related to each other. But if we consider a here transport in one dimensional wire, surprisingly enough, we will find all these three uh, Phenomena, all these three, uh, four, four, four limits. Uh, right. Um, the point is very simple. I uh, even uh, feel myself a bit confu uh, confused to stress in this. The resistance in one dimensional situation for one dimensional uh, wire grows with the length of the wire, right? One can see it in many ways. One can see it, for instance, that you put resistances in series, make wire longer and longer, so resistance just grows. Uh, very good. So let me look at this plot. Uh, here I plot the classical value of conductance of the wire, which is just one divided by the length of the wire. Resistance is proportional to the length, conductance is inversely proportional to the length. Uh, computed according to Coulomb's. Uh, to Ohm's law. Right. If I look at big values of the conductance, I see that the actual conductance with quantum effects taken into account, uh, well, it almost matches classical conductance. Then I plainly make wire longer and longer. Uh, adding more and more matter. Conductance goes down. Resistance increase, conductance goes down. We go close to zero. And we see the de deviations, weak localization. We know how much are they. They are of the order of conductance quantum in this case. Good. So if we go close to zero at distances of conductance quantum, Ohm's law is, is not holding anymore. So we would deviate from this dependence. The, uh, the, uh, the resistance does not scale linearly anymore, as it were, if Ohm's law would hold. Instead, we get here strong localization. So in fact, for a wire, whatever the wire, if it's total resistance to approaches resistance quantum, conductance approaches conductance quantum, um, the states are localized. 
localized like in quantum dots. So it looks like that instead of a, a long wire of this size, it is separated into pieces and resistance of each piece is inverse of uh, uh, conductance quantum. And each piece becomes a quantum dot with localized states. And these pieces are weakly connected. So it looks like there are barriers between quantum dots. For electron to go through all these barriers, it is difficult for an electron. So in this case, the uh, transmission uh, through all these barriers is a product of transmission through individual barriers. Then we expect that eventually resistance scales exponentially with the length of the wire. That was, was what was theory predicts. This is for coherent transport in 1D. Uh, let us look at different uh, uh, dimensionality. Uh, let us consider another geometry. Let us consider, for instance, a cube of uh, three-dimensional material. Will we see anything like this, any localization in 3D? No. And this is due to simple fact that resistance of uh, the cube doesn't grow with the size. Moreover, it goes like one over L. It's conductance which goes with the size. So if you make the cube bigger, there's no localization. Where localization can happen? the resistance of such cube increases with the uh, with making the cube smaller. So if the resistance of the cube of the um, of the, uh, um, of the smallest cube which you can make is uh, of the rotor of uh, wavelengths. If this resistance is of the rotor of resistance quantum, there is localization. So in three-dimensional materials, this makes uh, localization a material property. If this order is not, not that big, the resistance of smaller cube is still uh, um, is still uh, small in comparison with the resistance quantum. No localization for strongly disordered materials. Localization can take place. Two D is a situation intermediate between three D and one D. And the uh, situation can also be dis, um, understood in uh, simple terms, considering how conductance grows with the system uh, size. Uh, well, uh, what is relevant uh, uh, conductance? If one just takes uh, two dimensional squares, whatever the size of the squares, the conductance won't depend on this. But if one looks at localization, one understands that this geometry perhaps not the most proper one. When, the, uh, when you think of localization of a particle, you start in a given point, then wave function uh, the particle spreads around. So in fact, one would rather consider the conductance of uh, such uh, uh, such uh, d 
disk. When one electric has a very, um, is very small, and the circumference is of the disk is big. All right, so what is the conductance of the structure? It's something which you yeah, might have heard uh, in the course of electrostatics or whatever. It's very simple, it's at school level. In this case, uh, conductance um, is inversely proportional to the log of the ratio of two length scales. So, in fact, if you increase the scale L, conductance goes down, and at some stage, at some localization, at some, at some lens, it approaches conductance factor. And there, the wave function becomes localized. There, we have something like a formation of quantum delta size. Good. Let me just uh, say several words about realistic situation. When the states are localized, coherent transport is absent. But there must be some transport, right? You apply voltage, you still want to have some current. And the current is uh, mostly due to incoherent processes. So there are different localized states. Here I put some disordered potential. And um, uh, one can think of uh, transport as uh, of transitions between the states, tunneling through different barriers. Each transition should be accompanied with energy uh, absorption or emission. So all these processes actually require temperature to proceed. And uh, in uh, precisely those temperature, if strong localization takes place, we have uh, an insulator, we have no, no transport. Although uh, the system is still metallic, it still consists uh, of uh, electric. Uh, very good. That concludes all materials, material which I uh, wanted to present today. We have started this week uh, with quant small quantum corrections, weak localization, universal conductance fluctuations. Uh, we have figured out that uh, the scale is uh, GU. We have figured out magnetic dependence, interesting um, uh, uh, measurements of magnetic conductance, where one can see these effects. And we have, in addition to in an appendix to a lecture, we just look at strong localization. So thank you very much for your attention. Oh, I have one organizational question. I've forgotten about this. Um, wonder if um, uh, anybody is still uh, present. Oh, there's still a couple of people. Uh, I have a question. Um, the homework, there has to be a second home, uh, second package of homework. Is it already posted? Did you see the homework for quantum transport as a bright space? No, I guess everybody has uh, left. At least I don't get a uh, response to my question. Oh, where can I uh, find it? Uh, it has to be under assignments, I presume. So Yanis should have posted uh, homework. He promised to do this, uh, to do this at coming days. Uh, so please, please, uh, oh, okay. If you click on homework, I 
you see nice. Perhaps it's not posted yet, so I will uh, talk uh, to Yanis about this um, soon. Um, uh, anyway, the next homework session, I guess it will be in a uh, couple of weeks, so you will have uh, time to look at uh, your homework. Very good. Thank you very much for your attention. I finish this meeting.